Hi, I'm Jordan Ostroff with Jordan Law, and joining me today is Blair Jackson, the head of our business law department. Thanks so much for being here, Blair. Oh, thank you, Jordan. How you doing? I'm doing very well. Um, what I wanted to, what about you? I'm doing well. Everybody's safe, healthy at your household? Yep, all good over here. Yeah, same. So you can only hope everybody seeing this is in the same position. All right, so today what we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about business law in general. Then we'll go through the five or six most common areas of litigation or lack thereof that we have. And throughout that, we're going to provide some examples, some, tick, some tips, some tricks. We will not talk about ticks, tips and tricks. And that way, that'll help guide some business owners um, as they make their way through the process. Does that sound good, Blair? Yep, sounds good. All right, so walk me through kind of the the ten thousand foot view on business law. What are we talking about here? Well, I, I think the important thing to remember is the component parts of um, how you can help a business, right? And and who business basically touches. You know, it touches obviously customers and clients. It touches your employees. Um, you know, there are different types of business organizations. So some are small businesses, some involve small businesses with family members, what we call closely held corporations, some are bigger. So it, um, business law touches all of those people, both people that own businesses, work for businesses, and are potential clients of businesses. So really all aspects of our society, if you think about it. And really, I mean, with the exception of, you know, some some federal or state legislation, when we talk about business law, you know, two young kids running a lemonade stand all the way up to, you know, Walmart, Amazon, Boeing, those kind of giant companies, really, we're talking about a lot of the same issues. Is that correct? Absolutely right. Yes. Yep. Um, it, it's from the smallest business uh, involving, now there are different considerations when it's one person. Uh, as opposed to, you know, a thousand employees, but the principles remain the same. You know, you are in business. Uh, most businesses are in business to make a profit. There are some nonprofit organizations, but, um, you know, you're, touch, you're basically reaching out to clients and dealing with issues related to clients and in some cases employees and other shareholders too and owners. But again, I mean, so much of this really we're talking about the interaction between the business and the individuals, whether they're employees, whether they're vendors, whether the other businesses, you know, no matter how large the business is, they really need to interact with somebody else in some manner, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you can't have a business and have it one hand clapping, right? Uh, there has to be somebody that wants to utilize your business or pay for your business on the other end, at the very least. Right. That makes sense. So we're talking about not only we're talking about supply for the business, demand for the business, customers for the business, um, stuff the businesses has to buy, lease, use, employees, et cetera. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So when we're talking about business law, you know, we're talking about a business interacting with its employees, with its vendors, with its customers, with other businesses, supply side, demand side, et cetera. So am I correct in that? Yes, Absolutely. All right. And so tell me a little bit more about from, you know, again, that 10,000 foot perspective, what are some of the broad concerns a business has to think about? And then we'll move through into some of the more specifics here. Sure. Um, first and foremost, they have to think about what type of contracts they have with their vendors. They have to think about uh, employment contracts um, because they also want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the employment contracts are reflective of their culture, of their business culture. Uh, and additionally, uh, you wanna make sure that you have contracts that protect the business you know, in terms of liability and so forth, depending on what type of business they're in. So, um, you know, all the different players that we talked about that a business touches, vendors, employees, customers, there should be common sense and comprehensive agreements that, that govern those relationships. All right. So, I mean, it sounds to me like really the, the life cycle of a business kind of breaks up into three perspectives. You've got the, you know, the formation, the beginning step, you've got the business being run, and then you've got the business being sold or closing or terminating in some other manner. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. 
All right, so let's go in chronological order. Um, I want to talk about the formation of a business. So walk me through how does a business in the state of Florida get formed? Well, you have to uh, file something, either uh, articles of incorporation, if you decide to incorporate as a business. Um, you could also uh, choose to be a limited liability corporation. There's also a filing that's required for that. Um, and also called uh, something similar called Articles of Organization. Um, but basically, uh, you don't have to be incorporated to be a business in the state of Florida, but it would be my uh, strong opinion that in fact you should be to, in order to limit your liability and also you can get more favorable tax consequences for your business if you decide to do so. Other than saving money, is there any benefit to not incorporating? Sure, so obviously there's some costs associated with doing these articles and incorporating. So other than just the incorporation costs, is there any benefit to not having that corporate entity? Uh, no, you should definitely have that corporate entity for, I, I'd say the most important reasons in, in the following order are this. You want to make sure that you limit your liability to basically the, uh, the, the assets and value of the business so that somebody can't basically reach into your bank account to take money out if they sue you and successfully gain a judgment against you, know, you or your business. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that from a, a, a marketing standpoint, a lot of people won't do business with somebody. I mean, doing your due diligence you know, they basically as a customer, potential client of that business or vendor would be checking to see if that business is incorporated. And so if you're not incorporated, you know, that, that would certainly, you know, maybe prevent you from wanting to do business with that particular company. And people, you know, uh, private individuals are savvy enough now to see, well, is this a legitimate business? I'm gonna go on sunbiz.org or wherever I can find that they're incorporated. So, so definitely from a, uh, you know, a, a, a marketing standpoint, in addition to the very important reason of limiting your liability, I mean, I think it, it really behooves you to incorporate as a business, no matter how small you are. And so to, if you let me put on my marketing hat for a second, that's exactly how I feel when I get people's emails. You know, if your email is like, Joe cuts your lawn at AOL.com, I don't think that's nearly as professional as if it's Joe at, you know, day landscape or whatever it is along those lines so you know not only not only do you have the legal side of it but you've got that forward client facing benefit of like you said the sun biz how you present yourself um also you know i want to comment on it's also a lot easier to sell a corporation it's easier to sell that legal entity it's easier to sell that business when it exists as opposed to not having it and then you've got to create this legal entity for the purpose of selling it as well that's correct absolutely yep so I know that we could probably talk for 45 minutes just on, you know, choice of entity provisions, but in, you know, 45 seconds a minute, kind of give me some of the differences that we'll see there. Um, well, you could uh, file as a, uh, a lot of companies file as a C corporation if they're, and they, they're required to do that. Uh, basically what we understand is simply filing as a corporation um, that is determinative of having a certain amount of employees and so forth. But for small businesses, you primarily would want to consider filing as an S corporation. In an S corporation situation, you are taxed. You, you receive the liability of uh, uh, limiting liability um, that you would in any corporate uh, formation situation. However, you also benefit from being taxed as a sole proprietor. Uh, further, you could also decide to file as a limited liability corporation or LLC. Uh, in some situations, and I'm not a tax attorney, there are tax consequences to deciding whether to file as an S corporation or a limited liability corporation. And a limited liability corporation is definitely better if you have more than one person that is a, a co-owner of the business because they can benefit from the liability and tax issues. And then you can set out the rights and responsibilities of all the managers 
which is what you call the owners of the LLC. So S Corp and LLC, I would say, are the two primary corporate entities that, you know, that small businesses would want to consider. Well, really, though, we're looking at two different dis discussions, right? We're first looking at if it's going to be a corporation or a partnership or what it is along those lines. And then also we're looking at that S corporation status or C corporation for tax purposes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you want to figure out what is the best fit for your business first and foremost, and then you can, you know, you utilize either of those to make sure that your liability is being limited under the circumstances. And so to you know, pitch ourselves a little bit, I mean, that's kind of the benefit of going to a firm like ours where we've got a 30 year experienced business law attorney to really break those things out for potential business owners. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I would add as well is you could certainly, you don't have to uh, form, uh, you know, you can operate as a sole proprietor regardless of your business and not be incorporated. Also a partnership, people don't understand what that term means legally, because I think in our lexicon, right, the way we we talk as people, and hey, forming a partnership with somebody, you know, but there there are legal implications to that, and if it's not a limited partnership of some sort, you're offered no protection. So uh, probably important to to note that as well. If you and I partner up to form a business, and we call it, you know, Jordan and Blair uh, Inc. or whatever, but we don't you know, register that as some kind of, and file as some kind of limited liability entity, then you and I are both exposed to each other's together and separately to potential liability. Well, and that can be as simple as, you know, let's say I'm driving to meet a client, I get into an accident, the accident, the, the people could sue the business for that accident and could take all of your assets because they're not protected from the actions of the business. Is that correct? Exactly right. Yes. So, and so we're, we're I mean, we're talking about a couple hundred dollars for the purpose of the filings, right? Yeah. I, I think it's slightly more than that now, but not much. Um, so, so they're, they're dollars. Yeah. They're, they're not incredibly cost prohibitive, you know, and uh, it also depends if you're filing in Florida or somewhere else. And, you know, uh, but for, for purposes of, this discussion in Florida, it's not cost prohibitive. It's, it hovers around, I think it's around $250 filing fee right now for both an LLC or to incorporate. And really it's uh, depending upon what legal entity it'll change, excuse me, it'll change the filing a little bit. Maybe some of them are, you know, $70 more expensive or 50 bucks cheaper, or, you know, but it's all in that same general area. That's correct. Yes. And so from our standpoint, you know, potential client contacts us. I mean, for the most part, we, we're going to sit down with them for potentially an hour just to make the, the decision about what type of entity and S Corp or C Corp, right? Yeah, definitely. I want to find out what they're doing, wh wh what type of business are, there, are they in, you know? Um, for just our purposes of filing, we can kind of limit that, but we definitely want to find out what they're doing, how many people are going to be involved as owners, you know, how many potential employees they have sort of at that moment. There, there may be an opportunity to grow later on. We don't necessarily need them to commit to what their business will look like in a year or two years, but we just need to find out a little bit about their business and how many participants are involved and what they're doing. And then, like you said, probably an hour and some change spent you know, talking through the different you know, choices that they have or choice of entities to be more specific. And so I love this from the concept. I mean, so much of what we're talking about is contract law, right? We're talking about an agreement between two people or two parties that they're going to do X in exchange for Y and they're going to do Z in exchange for Z and, you know, whatever it is along those lines. Yes. Yep. So other than, you know, a specific couple statutes here or doing something that's that's obviously illegal, you can pretty much contract any rights and responsibilities inside this creation of a, for, of a company, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you can't, you can't run afoul of the law. And uh, depending on what type of business or industry you're in, you obviously have to adhere to, you know, those rules and regulations. If you're, you know, uh, shipping food over state lines, for example, or internationally, or, you know, then the FDA comes into play. So, you know, there are obviously, you know, different um, 
federal and state regimens that apply to different businesses. But but uh, just to circle back a little bit, it's it's not incredibly difficult to. I would not require a lot of information from you to be able to file uh, either uh, file for you as an S corporation or an LLC. So it's it's not like we have all these you know incredibly document intensive or anything like that. We could be able to get you up and running fairly quickly, provided that you give us some basic information about your business. Yeah. So, and I think we'll talk about this more as we go into talking about partnership agreements, a little bit more detail, but from this formation process, I mean, you're, there's a number of things that have to be filed depending upon the corporation, depending upon whether it's a profit or non, not profit, those kind of things, right? Yes, definitely. And the more detail is going to be better because then you can outline roles and responsibilities a little bit more specifically, right? Yes. Yeah. Factual detail as opposed to just, I, I, I wouldn't require, uh, you know, a ton of documents to be able to get you started. But yes, those, the questions I'm going to ask are primarily drilling down as far as what your business internally looks like or what you think it's going to look like, at least at a snapshot at this particular moment that we're meeting. And when it comes to doing this now, I mean, some of these, some of these decisions are going to be easier to fix, but some of them are going to have long-term consequences. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So for example, if you want to sell stock and you want to raise equity for the company, you know, you're going to have to pick to be a C corp, or at least I guess maybe there's some new thing that's coming in with S corps in certain specific circumstances. But for the most part, you know, you want to be a C corp so that you can sell shares of stock to other people. Oh, correct. Yes. And then, you know, at, at some point, are you considering, you know, uh, a nice kind of consideration? Are you going to take your business public and, uh, you know, do an IPO or whatever happens with that? So, yeah, um, the, we need a lot of information about the internal workings of your business, or at least what your plan is, you know? And I, I like it from the concept of, you know, you might spend a couple thousand dollars to get an attorney to draft all these things as tightly as possible. You might spend a few hundred dollars to get it filed. But if you don't do that correctly on, you know, day one, day 10, day 30, and you want to come back five years down the road and undo this, I mean, you could be talking about tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars. A absolutely. Um, specifically when it comes to uh, and I don't know if we're at the point where we want to talk about maybe some of the nuts and bolts of what should be in, you know, part of these uh, agreements. But uh, but to your point, yes, absolutely. It's much more expensive and maybe more difficult to undo things that are either not done or are poorly done. And in certain cases, it would be almost impossible. I mean, for some of them, it may be, it may be more beneficial to just dissolve the business and start it all over from scratch. Correct. Um, I, I'm dealing right now with the situation where uh, one of the shareholders uh, in a business uh, ended up dying and, um, you know, out of the blue, was not expected, um, not after a long illness or anything. And uh, that individual's, uh, those shares reverted uh, to uh, his spouse. And the spouse did not know how the business was run and what was going on with this. And so that's created, and they, they didn't have a lot of mechanisms for figuring out what would happen if, you know, they wanted to either dissolve the company or what they needed to do with her. So we're in the process of trying to bring everybody together. So they're all, they're all working together. They're all obviously very upset that this happened, but they're trying to make this, work in terms of, well, do we sell the business? Do we dissolve it? What does this look like now that this individual is not there to offer their talent and so on and, and their, their advice to the business? And that's an amicable situation that you're involved in right now, right? Totally I mean, amicable. Right now, absolutely. Yes. I, I can only imagine, you know, if you got a spouse who's upset at the, you know, husband cheating on with spouse of other business owner and then he passes away and now you got people that hate each other and the the wife hates the other wife and the husband hates the wife and the wife hates the, the you know the other spouse and then you you know you're just fighting back and forth not amicably you could be you know so much more expensive with this 
Correct. As we say in the law, that's what we would characterize as attorneys as a huge mess, right? Yeah, that's the technical term. Yes, correct. All right, so before we get into partnership agreements in a little bit more detail, when we're talking about those business formation and the business formation documents, anything else we need to touch on? Um, well, I think that when you are filing either for a limited liability corporation, LLC, or an S corporation, uh, you should always uh, think about having uh, bylaws that would attach to that. The bylaws need not be filed with the Articles of Incorporation or with the LLC, but those are managing documents that set out the rights and responsibilities of, of uh, the individuals in the business entity. And also, and maybe as important as anything else we'll talk about, we'll discuss how that business can be dissolved um, should a triggering event happen, like a death that we just discussed. Right, and so to put that in, to, you, to use a, an analogy here, so basically if you look at it like baseball, you know, the bylaws are going to be the rules of baseball. The business formation docs will be the creation of the Astros or the Yankees or the Red Sox or the Dodgers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what, what does that look like? What, is your, what does your team look like? What position are they playing to tease out the sports analogy? Uh, because I love to use sports analogies, as maybe you do. Um, so... Who are the team members? What positions are they playing? And um, but as opposed to any of that, which it doesn't fall, flow from an analogy, when do you fold the team up? That's the other thing. You well, gotta... I mean that that used to be a consideration and might currently be for the XFL or the uh, AAF last year. And oh, good point. Yeah. But yeah, but it's it's you know we always go we always go back. We're going to circle back to two things. A lot of this deals with contracts. And it's easier to do this stuff in advance. You know, a stitch in time saves nine. The early bird gets the worm. You know, there is no expression that I'm aware of that says it's better to wait till the last minute and do things too late. Correct. Yeah. All right. So then let's swap over to um, partnership agreements a little bit. And obviously, these are going to be very similar because part of the business formation will be a partnership agreement or an operating agreement or something along those lines. But talk to me about that in a little bit more detail. Well, um, if you if you have a just a partnership agreement that isn't um, some sort of limited partnership agreement, so if two or more people create a partnership, you know, they're, part of that as an operation of law is that they're going to be sharing the profits and the losses of the business, and somebody can look to anybody in the partnership to be made whole. I, you, you had used an analogy about you know, a car accident or, you know, basically one partner can uh, be individually responsible for something happening that other partners will end up having to pay for. So I would say that, um, you know, if you're thinking about some kind of partnership agreement, it should be uh, a limited partnership agreement, which works somewhat similarly to an LLC or a limited liability corporation. Uh, you can limit the, uh, the liability of the specific partners. Uh, one partner may be more responsible in certain areas than others, but it's all governed by contracts. So um, anytime anybody proposes a partnership to anybody else, um, you know, you, you should, if you're seeing this and somebody has made that, you know, uh, invitation to you to be part of a partnership, those are the questions that you need to ask because just being part of a partnership will not, limit your liability in that circumstance. Right. And so when we're putting together this document, I mean, this this could be truly a partnership. It could be, you know, four or five people getting together, or it could be other businesses, or it could be a mix. I mean, right. it may be two or three businesses getting together, or maybe a business joining up with two or three other people. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can agree to do as long as everybody's agreeing to do the same thing. Correct. And so... You know, I think that most people, if we weren't attorneys, uh, we might think of a partnership in a different way as opposed to the legal implications of that. So if you're talking about a group of people that are getting together to put a business together, instead of looking at it as a partnership, from a legal perspective, I'm steering them into a discussion about incorporating somehow, you know, maybe as a, an LLC or something like that, you know? 
And so some of the major things that we want to talk about there is, you know, who's putting in money and how much we want to talk about what roles and responsibilities everybody, every one of those people are going to have or businesses are going to have as it goes through. We want to talk about what percentage of ownership each party has. We want to talk about what's going to happen if somebody wants to leave or if the entire thing wants to get dissolved. I mean, what else, what else do we really want to make sure we have in that agreement? Um, we want to make sure that we talk about what happens when somebody, um, maybe there's a, uh, a morals clause or something in your agreement or they get arrested and you don't want them to be a part of the LLC anymore. So what is the, uh, what's the separation strategy? Uh, because, you know, in, uh, in many situations, if you don't have a governing agreement in the state of Florida, at least I can speak to, if you don't have a governing agreement about that. Some of these things might lead to a dissolution of the business and you don't want that. You just want to be able to expel the individual that has either broken the law or done something to bring disfavor onto the business or, you know, anything along those lines. So, um, you know, voting a person off the island, I guess we could put it that way. You definitely want to make sure that you have that provision in your, your, your organizing documents and also the dissolution of the business under what circumstances, can a, uh, uh, a business be dissolved? So just getting back briefly, uh, I, I neglected to mention that when you're sort of voting somebody out of the business, what does that look like? Um, you know, are there, is there a super majority vo a, a voting block within your LLC or does everybody have one vote? And uh, is it a majority vote that requires that you then leave? Those are all things that you need to look at. And obviously, you know, we don't, you don't want to turn your business into a, a real, well, I guess Survivor is sort of real life, into a reality show yeah. where, all right, there's eight partners. And if you vote, if you vote the eighth person off, then everybody can gear up against the seventh person. And, you know, you don't want to end up voting partners, you know, out or other businesses out or other owners out, you know, that quickly because that's going to create a lot of instability. It can. Um but there just needs to be a mechanism for it. It's amazing how many small businesses I've worked with and talked to that don't have any of these things anywhere. They just, they filed their articles of incorporation, which are very basic, just name, address, and serial number primarily, and a registered agent, and then they're off to the races. But it's so important to have documentation in, a, in bylaws or something like that that sets out all these things because you know the the temptation is a lot of businesses are started with people that like each other right, right? I mean, it's not always that oh I have a skill set and I've been hooked up with someone who has another skill set most of the time people that are friends or at least have some kind of professional relationship get into business because they think they're gonna be friends forever and they also like the ideas that everybody's bringing to the table but you know, sometimes money gets in the way, as we all know, money can get in the way of friendships, you know, and in, in, in businesses, like, like you're not bringing in as much business as I am, or, you know, something happens. And so, it, or somebody loses interest in really being part of that business and they want to do something else. There has to be a mechanism to keep the normal functioning and, and allow for the business to maintain profitability while making sure that that other person is it removed in a clean and efficient manner that sets out so that everybody's on notice of what everybody's rights and responsibilities are. Right. I mean, I always tell people business is like a marriage. You know, everybody gets into it happily on day one, but obviously, you know, so many marriages end in divorce because they're not happy on day 365 or 720 or, you know, day 15,000. So right. the same applies to a lot of businesses. Sure. Now, unlike the um, formation documents, the partnership agreement is something that can be added or amended later to reflect it as things change, correct? Yeah, correct. And so if we're talking about agreements, instead of partnership agreement, I would prefer to say your uh, you know, uh, bylaws, if it's a corporation, or um, you know, your, whatever your uh, articles of organization and bylaws are for your LLC. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I, I, I just I say that because I think a lot of people in our society tend to think of 
they don't have the same understanding of what a partnership truly is. So we'll talk in terms of either an LLC or an S corporation and bylaws. So it, with the LLC, the proper, I guess, nomenclature there would be members. You know, LLC is composed of members. You can be a um, uh, uh, member and, and depending on what their responsibilities are, they can be managers of the LLC. So you can have member managers. That's the way most LLCs are, right? Um, you're responsible for X. I, uh, we have an LLC. Let's say you're responsible for X. I'm responsible for Y. Uh, Joe is responsible for Z. Um, but you can also have manager managed LLCs where you just we find somebody and we're like, we're not interested in running this business. We're, we're interested in the profits it could bring, but you know what you're doing. And you're you're interested in the industry, so we'll bring you in to manage our LLC. So it could be a manager managed LLC. We don't have to do that. Okay. So any you know that was a very interesting point that you made um, from that standpoint. Any other tips, tricks, suggestions? You know things for people to think about when it comes to putting together these bylaws, these membership agreements, the partnership agreements. Yeah, I don't know if they're necessarily tips or tricks, but a lot of them just revert back to common sense, you know? And that, I, I think a lot of people tend to think that some of this stuff is just so complex. They, 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 they as you so ably said at the beginning of our, our talk here, you know, a lot of this stuff isn't governed by laws. So, you know, and, and, and by federal or state statutes. So think about what type of business you're going to have and how are you going to divide up how are you dividing up the responsibilities of that business you know I'm going to be doing this part of this you're going to be de dealing with the vendors you know uh, this I'm going to be responsible for the bookkeeping whatever it is you know so think about what each role you know the different roles that each person may play in the LLC then also think about um, how long do you think it was this an LLC that's just launched for a project like a, a venture capital or a joint venture type of enterprise or is this something that you're envisioning is going to ideally pay for your retirement you know that you'll be doing forever there are different reasons why people form companies so think about that in terms of again your organizing principles of your business and then finally as I said um, think about, uh, and also if it's a business where um, people are bringing capital into the business, uh, working capital, um, systems, you know, uh, hardware, whatever, any of that stuff, what does that look like if the business dissolves, right? Who gets what? And also, so important, profits and losses, right? And, and uh, being this, we're optimistic people as, as Americans. We tend to think of, you know, ourselves when people are forming a business they they get excited about it and they think they've got the greatest idea in the world or they've got something else to bring to bear. And they think about the profits they're going to make as opposed to how losses are going to be. Handled. So the dividing up of profits, losses, dividends. So the monetary aspect of how your business is going to flow and run and then eventually exit strategies for individual members and situations under which the LLC would dissolve. Yeah, and, and so the advice I give to everybody is, you know, you don't have to make it equal, but you want to make it fair for everybody who's involved in it. You know, that may right. be that somebody's doing a lot less of the work, but they've got a lot less of percentage of the profits or somebody's bringing in a lot more of the capital, so they've got a lot more ownership stake when it comes to those sort of things. Definitely. So, so I, I guess, you know, just to to tie it all up, think about your relationship with these people as you're entering it, and that would should prompt a lot of discussions. All right, we're forming a business. What do you see? You what are you bringing to the table, person X? What are you bringing to the table, person Y? What am I bringing to the table? How do we want to organize this? How should we compensate ourselves for this? How should we deal with losses with this? If somebody or all of us want to leave, what does that look like? And what's our relationship? to our uh, employees and vendors and so forth. But the bylaws should be the internal stuff with the owners primarily. Right. 
Well, and I think another way to look at it is, you know, put yourself on both sides of every issue. You know, if you're the partner being kicked out or, or trying to sell their ownership versus one of the ones staying, you know, you want to think that it's fair on both sides because you don't know which side you're going to be on when you have to actually institute those mechanisms. Correct. Yep, exactly right. And then the other thing I always suggest to everybody, the prevailing parties provision, you know, if you have to file suit, whoever wins, uh, whoever loses covers everybody's attorney's fees. I think that's always a little bit of an easy financial incentive that will get people to operate in better, in, in good faith, in more good faith, in, in great faith. So that's, that's my two cents. Yeah, no, there should be a mechanism if you all end up suing each other. So the idea is to, if you put enough of the things that we've talked about already in place, then it'll probably prevent lawsuits because you'll be able to look back on the bylaws, right? So there's discord in a business and somebody's like, wow, I want to get out of this right now. I've forgotten we've been running for 10 years. Let me look at what we put in the bylaws. Let me look at what, you know, maybe some of that is included in your articles of incorporation. And that, you know, if it's there in black and white, clearly stated how this stuff is going to go down, you know, that avoids a lot of litigation. A lot right. of times we're litigating stuff because there is no black and white. You know, there, nobody knows what the provision was in place. So we're relying on, well, I think I had a conversation with Jim or, Jane, where she said X at one point in time, and that you can imagine just how messy that is. And then a judge or a jury has to try and figure out what was the real intent of the parties. When you can just reflect back on it, you know, oh, okay, well, then I guess I don't have a lawsuit. Or I guess, you know, you take it to an attorney, the attorney's like, no, here in black and white, clearly stated, you know, so important and, and you know, doing this stuff. I, uh, you know, anytime you can, um, you know, you, you're paying for sound legal drafting. You don't want people that are just, you know, dabbling in this stuff. Oh, yeah, I could put together a, a business agreement. You know, it's so important to be clear and concise in your wording. You know, it just absolutely is vital. And the hope is it avoids litigation down the road. Well, and the other thing is keep it updated. You know, you'll have businesses that have been running for five or 10 years where the document says A, but the way they've been handling the business the whole time is B, and then somebody gets upset and wants to reinvoke A, you know, the A method, even though they've been using the B method for so long, but they never updated the documents to reflect the ability to basically be breaching it the whole time by not following what the document says. Correct. And that's why I think it's important and it's a I know you know this, it's a service we offer as well. We can do a business audit, basically, a checkup. What do you have? What's, you know, what does this look like? Do parts of either the articles or uh, or your bylaws need to be amended? You know, right. for all things, like you said, it's so easy to get into habits, maybe some not necessarily bad, but just straying from the original intent of what you had, you know, in your original bylaws. So having a periodic uh, audit or update, you know, bring me in, sit down with me, here's what we have, but we sort of turned this way or we're straying from this, it's, it's a very easy, I won't even call it a fix. It's very easy to amend right. your articles or your bylaws. So. Well, and a lot of times that, you know, the change that they made is for their own benefit. It makes things run smoother, it makes them run more efficiently, it makes them run more profitable. It's something they just didn't consider when they first put the business together. Correct. All right. So anything we need to talk about else from the standpoint of the formatting the business and putting together that initial agreement? No, just that it's it's relatively easy to do with a little bit of legal guidance. I can help you through those things. And uh, and it's also not going to be cost prohibitive. You know, I think a lot of people are attracted to maybe, you know, these services that you see on television because they just think that attorneys are cost prohibitive prohibitive with this stuff. And it's it, it doesn't have to be, especially if you know what you're doing. And I like to think that I do. So, Well, and litigation is going to be a heck of a lot more expensive. I mean, the... Every the, time out. What? Yeah. Every time out, yes. Yeah, the, the punishment for not doing this correctly is going to be at least a tenfold hit to you or the business or something, you know, somebody financially somewhere. 
Yeah, tenfold's probably charitable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, probably a lot more than that. All right. So going through the the last two things that we've covered, basically we've got the beginning of our business put together. You know, we figured out our article, we figured out our uh, choice of entity, we figured out our S corp, C corp, we got our our agreement together. Now we're operating our business. So I know one of the biggest things that we talk about at this stage is going to be employment contracts. Correct. Correct. Um, yeah. So a lot of that is going to depend on the type of, you know, a business you're running, right? Um, <clears throat> are there situations where you're working with a lot of, are they true employees or are they, now again, we're getting into a term of art, right, in, in, in the legal realm. Uh, are they true employees or are you dealing with a series of contractors, you know? And so that you don't get to decide as the employer um, who should be characterized as an employee or as a contractor. That's something for the IRS to look at. That's going to be judged independently by these different regulatory bodies. Well, and so I love there was a, a thing somebody posted online and they were like, taxes make no sense. Here's why. And it was like, you know, you have to um, you have to come up with how much you think you owe the government. The government knows how much you owe them, but they won't tell you that. You have to guess. And then if you get it wrong, they can send you to prison. <laughs> right. And so it's, it's very, very similar concept to the W-2-1099. Like at the end of the day, you're deciding whether or not you're going to take out taxes. You're deciding whether or not you're going to have them on workers' comp. You're going to decide whether or not, you know, all these other dis decisions – but at the end of the day, the IRS is going to decide if you're right or not. And the penalty could be very costly if you're not. Definitely. So, yeah. So that's why, that's one aspect of this. Are you truly, do you truly have employees that are, and some of the things that I, the IRS would look at, for example, are, are you working for, you know, other businesses or are you only working for one business? You know, are you, um, you know, paid a salary or or, or uh, salary or hourly, or how does that work? You know, so um, you know a lot of people would rather rather not characterize somebody as being an employee for tax purposes, but you don't get to make that call. You know? Right. So, I mean, putting aside that part, because really that's kind of a, a tax question for sure. I'm talking about from the business law side, like putting together these agreements with contractors or with employees. You know, walk me through that process. Okay. Well, you know, first and foremost, uh, you want to be clear if it's, uh, you know, if it's with vendors or uh, or clients and customers. You know, what are what service are you offering as a business? Okay. How much does the service cost? But but well, actually, let me take a step back. You want to be very clear about what you're offering, what service or goods or, or a combination of both you're offering and make sure that that's in your agreement with very clear terms for payment and what the obligations are for both the business and the, and the, um, and the customer or the vendor, right? All right. So basically, so really you're talking about this from both perspectives. You're talking about this from, money into the business for services and money out of the business to vendors. Sure. Yep. So let's, for right now though, let's just focus on, you know, the business is hiring employees or they're hiring contractors to come in and do the work. Walk me through that process. And then we'll talk about contracts with customers and contracts with vendors or other businesses. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, certainly what you want to do is make sure that, uh, depending on the type of business it is, um, you know, that, that uh, their responsibilities are clearly outlined, as we talked about. Um, also, uh, if it is a you know particularly dangerous business or there are uh, risks involved somehow, that those are clearly stated. Um, you know, uh, is there? Uh, it should be somewhere indicated in there what the insurance situation you know looks like, whether you're covering the employee and so forth. But also, you want to set out your corporate culture in the agreement as well. What do you pride yourselves on doing? Um, what um, you know? Uh, what is acceptable at the workplace? Acceptable behavior or not acceptable? Um, what are grounds for termination? Uh, so, what do are you provided three warnings? Are you uh, can you be terminated on site? Um, 
in most circumstances, employers hold a lot of cards when it comes to terminating an employee. Uh, there are obviously some, some very big exceptions, and those usually have to do with whether you've been the victim of discrimination for race, ethnicity, right. uh, gender identity, so on and so forth. Um, but also there are medical leave issues as well. So, so in a, an employment agreement, you should address all those issues. What's acceptable workplace behavior? Um, you know, uh, in addition to, you know, any benefits, um, how you could potentially lose those benefits through your conduct as an employee. Basically, what we talked about in terms of the LLC, we're talking about now with the employee, for example. You know, what are your right? What what do you owe the uh, in this in this arrangement that you have? Uh, what do you owe the employee as an owner of a business, and what does the employee owe you? You know. So, and I know Florida talks about it. What is it? It's an agreed upon exchange of detriments or something. What's how does what how does Florida word that? Um, yeah, uh, and that's and that's uh, there are other states, and that's. That all that goes back to restatement of contracts and that kind of thing, but but it's the idea that you are, you know, you're giving something up. I guess in essence, um, you know, the employee is giving up obviously the time of their day. They're giving up their resources, their intellectual knowledge, their product knowledge, for example, that they can bring to bear on this, and the uh, employer is usually giving up money you know, or some kind of compensation that could be a combination of, you know, uh, a salary and benefits or anything like that. So that, that would be my understanding of that. Everybody's giving up a little something for this arrangement to work. Right. And so, and again, we're talking about such a minimal, minimal limitations on what you can agree to here. you know, we're talking about, we've got federal minimum wage, we've got state minimum wage, We've got some FMLA requirements for companies of all different sizes. Um, certain states may have a requirement for employer offered certain benefits at certain sizes. But really, I mean, we're we're almost unlimited in what can be agreed to here as long as it's legal. Correct. And just to add to what you said, obviously, uh, discrimination issues as well. You know that uh, you cannot, you know, discriminate. Or in this, and another aspect of this is. Uh, you know, you can't engage or perpetrate or put forward a hostile work environment. And right. that could be as an employee. That's not necessarily always top down, but if an employee is, you know, um, basically closing the door and exposing, you know, other employees to pornographic material or other offensive material or making comments or lewd suggestions, you know, all those things, um, you know, that. That should be outlined, and it could be easily outlined just saying that you're following federal and state protocol when it right. comes, you know. But there should be something in the workplace if you don't work in a virtual workplace that actually sets all those things out, and that's helpful for you to enforce later on. But to your point, yes, it's not. this is not rocket science like we're reinventing the wheel other than four or five areas that need to be addressed in an employment agreement, you can kind of tailor it the way you want, you know? So, and again, just make sure you have the, you know, the way to dissolve it. So what would be a termination for cause, a termination not for cause, what notice requirements you want, what sort of leave and other benefits you want to offer, plus, you know, the salary, the bonus structure, any, you know, any other compensation. Yeah, on that point too, I think it's important because I'm doing a lot of this type of work, or I've seen a lot of this recently, where um, you know it's always an issue. What is termination for cause? Because the trigger, if you terminate somebody for cause and you can prove it, then they can't get them. They can't get unemployment from you, basically. Right. Um, so I think it always helps in the employment agreement to have that kind of clearly stated. What would be at least some examples of, of termination for cause. You did this, you did that, you broke the law. You know, it doesn't matter necessarily um, what it is. If it doesn't hit those areas of protected classes, then it could be pretty much anything, you know? So that can be very helpful. But obviously the common ones we're looking for would be, you know, being so terrible at your job after receiving some sort of notice about it, 
you know, maybe showing up drunk or otherwise intoxicated, committing crimes, you know, those would be like the, the most common for cause issues, right? Uh, yes. Um, oftentimes, um, for cause doesn't necessarily take into account your competency. That's usually used more if you violated a morals clause or anything like that. So in other words, you can oftentimes get unemployment benefits even if you were incompetent. Uh, yeah. Okay, so be more fraudulent. Or if you were fraudulent or okay. you were stealing from the company or you were, as you, I think you alluded to, not meeting your hours, you know, you're coming in late habitually, which we could also call time theft. Right. And those are the disqualifiers. But um, you can be, you know, even straying into negligence as an employee, if it's basically just costing them money because you're terrible at your job, they may still be able to get unemployment. All right. So now, Blair, you were talking about something to add to employment agreements, wanting to have the opportunity to have them not be able to compete against the business. And walk me through that. Yeah. Uh, well, in, uh, in most situations, uh, the law practice of law and, and hiring attorneys being a, a, the rare exception, most of the time you can put together a non-competition clause in your agreement uh, for your employees. And that's perfectly legal for you to do that because you are investing time in them. You're investing resources with them. You oftentimes don't want to lose talent that learned everything at your, at, you know, from your company. And then they're like, great, now I'm going to take this on the road or I'm going to form my own business and directly compete with, with your business. So uh, non-competition agreements are enforceable if they are reasonable, and that's a legal term to be uh, of art, if they're reasonable in terms of, uh, of time. So, um, you know, uh, generally speaking, for most businesses, a two-year uh, 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 provision in a non-compete you can't compete uh, with them for two years or maybe five years, depending on the type of business, um, you know, is going to be deemed reasonable uh, by a court. Uh, also, it has to be. Well, jump in. So we're talking, we're looking at reasonable really in three factors. We're looking at a reasonable amount of time for you not compete. We're talking about a reasonable location for you not to compete them with inside that location. And we're talking about a reasonable limitation on what would be competition and what wouldn't be. Am I correct in that? Uh, yes, yeah. Um, and then we get to the geographical location portion of that, but that's exactly right. And it depends. I mean, you know, to, you know the, the first part of this with respect to, to time, it's also, and in, in when you're dealing with location, you know, if it's a home-based business, probably not so much, you know, but, uh, but anyway. Um, but let's get to the, you know, when we're talking about geographic location, it also has to be reasonable in terms of geography. So if you're dealing with two brick and mortar businesses, um, you know, probably something like 50 to 100 miles, totally acceptable. Um, across the country, thousands of miles, maybe not so much. Um, one of the first, as a younger attorney, much younger attorney, one of the first non-competes I ever handled when I worked for a firm involved um, a uh, web hosting service. This is and this probably the first time I'd ever heard this term, web hosting. And so they had a company, and this guy broke off. He'd sign a non-compete. Well, how do you impose a geographic location on something that exists on the, on the Internet? Uh, and that, that's something that we actually discussed in the context of a hearing, and the judge sided with us and agreed to enforce the non compete and said, you know, just because you didn't have a geographic, it, it, it seems impossible and would be impossible to impose a geographic location on that. Um, so that as we're all working virtually and there are different, you know, types of situations like that, that part of the equation is, is becoming less and less important. Still important if it's brick and mortar, and, uh, you know, you're maybe both working in a small town or a smaller location, but, uh, but maybe less so than the time, you know, than the time component of it, I should say. Right. And then also you're talking about what other work is actually limited. So, for example, 
you know, if you're an in-house accountant for a personal injury firm with a non-compete, you know, you may not be able to go across the street to another PI firm. You also may not be able to go 25 miles away to a criminal defense firm, but you can probably go across the street to a dentist office. You can probably go 150 miles away to another personal injury firm. You could probably go, I mean, you know, you're going to limit what would actually be the com competitive action too. Sure. And, and so, yeah, important part of that. So what is actually, what conduct or business is actually um, prevented by the non-compete or ideally prevented? You can't be doing something the same or substantially similar. So if you're in a business, um, it might even be the same type of business, but you're not you know, doing as an employee, you're not involved in direct competition with them and in, in with, with respect to what you were doing. Let's let's say you were a salesperson at business A and then you went over and you're just the bookkeeper at business B, uh, you may not be bound by that agreement because what you're doing for business B, even if it's five miles away or right across the street, is not the same or substantially similar as to what you were doing at business A, which is what they're trying to prevent. Right. So again, we're looking at a time frame that they can stop you from doing it, a geographic location they can stop you from doing it, and what actually is the work that they're going to stop you from being able to do. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So now, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, anything else that we need to talk about when it comes to the employment agreements? Uh, no. I just, again, you know, clearly state it. So the employee and the employer know what they're getting into before they engage in this relationship, you know? Okay. And, and a lot of these things are negotiable too on both sides of the equation. So, and I've been a part of that on both sides. I've negotiated employment agreements for, you know, employers and employees. So it's like a, con like a contract is a series of obligations that's negotiated. An employment agreement is a contract. It's the same as, anything else, but don't do it on a, uh, you know, on a handshake or uh, I know this person, uh, they go to war for me. No, have something in right. I mean, right. it's basic, but it, I don't care how close you are with that individual. That goes for all these agreements. Have something in writing so that you can refer, even refer to and just say, I don't even remember what we said about this. Our business is going great. What happens if X? Let's look at what we put together. You know, and well, then, and a lot of times I think the closer you are on day one, the more important it is to have the documents just because if things go sideways, they go so much more seriously sideways. Yep. I've, I, I've tried to talk certain people into that. Like I, you know, people that were friends that I knew and they said, we're really good friends and you know us and why should we even, you know, like cocktail party stuff or whatever, having a beer and just saying, Blair, what do you think about this? Oh, it's a great idea, right? Oh, I don't need all this paperwork, and it's like, you know, let me t let me tell you a few stories, and then, right. you, you, know. you don't need it until you do need it. Exactly, things can go wrong between people. All right, so then let's switch a little bit. So we're talking about the agreement there between the business and an employee. Let's talk about between the business and a customer. So a contract, an engagement letter, something along those lines. Kind of walk me through that process. Sure. Um, so important, obviously, again, uh, to, to indicate what products or services you're offering the potential customer um, and then what the financial terms are, you know, how will that be paid for? Will it be paid for over time? Um, and also, is this a, uh, a lot of contracts will have, uh, it basically will just go on into perpetuity unless one party uh, or the other decides to terminate the agreement. So right. you want to decide if it makes sense for you to have a finite term for this agreement or whether you want it to just be ongoing as long as both parties are happy. But And that's okay so long as you provide the option of like a 60-day notice or – and that would, that would be my recommendation, no less than like a 60-day notice if you don't want to work with, uh, you know, 60 days – towards the termination of an agreement or 60 days if it's a contract in perpetuity to let the other side know, hey, I don't want to do this anymore, you know? Um, 
So in addition to that, um, we we'll also want to set out what could be considered a breach because it's a contract like anything else. What would be, a cons would be considered a breach of that agreement? Now, ordinarily, obviously, if you're uh, on the customer or client side, you're breaching if you don't pay, right? So you don't pay timely. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a little trickier on the, um, you know, on the, on the business side of things, um, you know, because oftentimes, you know, maybe the client or customer is like, well, gee, that looks like low grade, uh, you know, material or whatever it is. No, I think it's actually good grade, you know, so they're, they're judging the, your breach is differently than, um, you know, than, than uh, a client, you know, clients responsible for just paying for it, you know, but the client may have more questions about what services are you truly providing the services that they paid for to the extent that they paid for them, you know, are you getting, are they getting full value for, um, you know, for what they hired you to do? So you need to clearly state what those things are and maybe even a curing mechanism if there's like a problem that comes up potentially between uh you know between the the business and the and the client you know how do we cure this or give us seven days to try and make this right if we need to and by that we are talking about is like so let's say you contract with somebody to build a deck and they're supposed to use a certain type of wood and that wood isn't available they use a different kind then you may give them a period of time to make it right renegotiate the price do something else to make up for it etc right yeah exactly okay yeah. so when we're talking about a contract i mean in theory like a a receipt is a contract right like it's it's walmart telling you that you gave walmart 15 dollars in exchange they gave you this these pants all the way up to maybe you know a 75 page contract to build a house that includes you know exactly what tile you're going to use exactly what drywall insulation i mean everything in between those things is what we're talking about here for a contract, right? Yeah, definitely. And there are lawsuits that are predicated sometimes on, well, and then you know, taking it even a step further, uh, you know, you can have oral agreements that are binding contracts under certain circumstances. I pledge to do something for you, and then I don't do it. I breached my, I potentially breached an oral contract to you. But I've seen a lot of, and I've been a part of lawsuits on both sides that sometimes didn't involve anything other than invoices or, you know, putting things together that established that there was a relationship. But you're exactly right. An invoice or a receipt could be considered a binding contract in certain situations. Okay. Um, anything else we need to talk about when it comes to that receipt or that contract with, with a customer? No, I, I would say um, just – make sure that you have an agreement with them that extends beyond just an invoice. <laughs> you know, um, I think a lot of businesses, like I said, and I keep coming back to this idea that businesses, they're, you know, they're in business to make money. There's so much effort and resources put forward with regard to that. Sometimes without thinking about, you know, these common sense agreements that we're talking about. So don't rely on an invoice, you know, when you could put together just a simple contract, the, the client or customer knows what they're getting into. It just makes things so much easier moving forward, you know? So. And we're not saying that more information is better. We're saying that more clarity to what that agreement is, is better. Yeah, exactly. Because for example, an invoice, it may not have everything on the invoice that the, that the, contractor was supposed to do or whatever or or you know that also if you have something at the end of the agreement that says this is the entire agreement between the parties you know right you can imagine on the flip side right so you're dealing with the invoice oh no but yeah but we had a separate discussion after that or he wrote something on a piece of paper that i don't have anymore that said he would do more work for me or you know the that's the kind of stuff that that happens so if you can tie it up in one agreement and say, this is it, this is the only thing between the two of us, man, you're way ahead of the game. You know? So, and then again, you know, we're talking about what to do if, if things go sideways. I know you mentioned the easiest thing being the, the buyer or the customer needs to pay the money at a certain period of time. The business obviously has a more serious obligation. 
Um, but when it comes to like true services, so lawyers, accountants, even to some extent, you know, doctors, a lot of what really they're doing in there is just promising you a good faith effort or to use their best, you know, uh, education, skill, knowledge, training, experience, those sorts of things. Am I right? Yeah, I can't speak to, uh, I'm not a doctor, never played one on TV, but uh, probably more comfortable dealing with that with regard to what we all do uh, in the legal profession. You can't promise results. For the right. Law. Well, but, you know, there are situations where you can. If you contract me to uh, put together and file an LLC for you, I'll do it. <laughs> you know, I can promise you that I will do that unless it's, you know, for uh, something you know, grossly illegal or, you know, something like that. Right. But we can't we can't promise that they'll never get sued over that. We can just promise that we'll use our good faith effort, your 30 years experience, et cetera, to make sure that that's as well written as possible to avoid as much litigation as possible. Yeah, definitely. But yes, for the most part, we're we're just using our best efforts. And for, in most services, that's the case. You know, um, although, you know, in, in different types of industries and things, you know, you have businesses that are like, no, I guarantee that I'll make this right. And that that's right. where your provisions become so important too. You like know? what provisions? Like a cure provision in a contract where it's like, you know, most contracts are like, oh, you don't like the way I did that? Or, okay, yeah, you know what? I took another look at this. Instead of suing me, can you give me 10 days or 14 days or 30 days to be able to make this right for you? You know, because the whole goal is to avoid litigation. If you're, if you're from the small perspective, you absolutely want to avoid being sued if you can. That's really what we're that's the overarching theme of what we're talking about, I think, you know. Right. I mean, we're, we're building up to talk about litigation, but so much of this is to avoid it because yeah. litigation takes time, is expensive. It's a lot harder to judge what the outcome will be. You know, you may have to go to trial to get what you want. You may get an award for a bunch of money that isn't recoverable. I mean, it's a lot easier, cheaper and faster to avoid litigation. Definitely. Yep. So then when we switch over to vendor contracts, I mean, for the most part, a vendor contract is going to be the same as your contract with your customers, just you as the business or the customer of somebody else's business here. That's correct. Um, the one thing that may be a little bit different with a vendor agreement, especially for businesses that are startups, is that sometimes they may want a personal guarantor. You know, they might want a personal guarantee from one of the members, one of the incorporators of the business, one of the members of the LLC, right? So you got a startup and you desperately need, um, you know, uh, I can't think of an example right now, but you desperately need a vendor to make your business work. And they're like, yeah, but your business is just starting. and You've got no track record of showing a profit with your business. So I'm going to make you sign a personal guarantee that says that that money is going to come out of your pocket or your, you know, your, your the other member's pocket or both of your pockets to make sure that this is paid for. In other words, we're going to prevent you from limiting liability in that regard. The yeah. easiest way for that would be like a loan. You know, you've got this startup where you're going to need three or four employees to get paid for six months before your big government contract pays out. Then right. you may have to a personal guarantee on the bank loan to fund payroll for so long. Correct. And I, I've dealt with a lot of those situations and seen a lot of those situations where smaller businesses or maybe, you know, and they may be incorporated, but the vendor may be insisting, might be insisting that they use a personal guarantee contract so they can't shield themselves with a the liability. So that's the one sort of aspect of a vendor agreement that's a little bit different than your standard agreement with a customer or a client. Right. Okay, so anything like other than really read through the contract as a business, maybe have your attorney look at it if it's such a large contract. I mean, what else does this business need to think about when going into vendor agreements? Um, well, um, you know, right now, sort of thinking about the, are they going to have, you know, does the business have some kind of business interruption insurance? Or, uh, you know, what happens if, they're not able to get the product as the business that they are then in turn selling to you, you know? So are there provisions in place where, um, you know, the vendor can't or is in a, in a position to automatically turn around and sue you, 
You know, do you have sort of a grace period where you can, you know, try to provide for that? Uh, you want to make sure that there's, um, you know, something sort of protecting you in that regard. So, you know, I think that kind of wraps up the that part, and we need to now talk about litigation. Am I correct there? Yes. Yep. Okay, so let's say our, you know, formation documents weren't done correctly or we hit an issue that wasn't figured out in the employment contract or we hit, you know, a problem between vendors. Walk me through the beginning stages of litigation. Like what are we doing before litigation actually commences for the most part? Well, uh, if you're on the plaintiff side of a small business and somebody owes you money, um, you know, whether it's a collection matter for a client or a vendor owes you something, or there's a breach of contract, usually you start with a demand letter before you go into litigation. Um, and you're letting the other side know, uh, you know, that this is what uh, your client has indicated has happened. You have information to believe that, um, you know, they have a cause of action, so they can actually proceed with a lawsuit because it was either a breach of contract or one of the causes of action that we understand to be uh, to be uh, actionable um, in the state of Florida. And, uh, and so you're giving them an opportunity if it's a monetary comp if it's monetary compensation you're looking for, then you're saying, please pay this within 10 days or so. And if you do that, we're not going to have a problem. You know, we'll, we'll uh, put together the necessary paperwork and everybody will walk away from each other. So I always like to start with a demand letter because obviously it's less expensive for the client because as we've talked about, litigation is incredibly expensive. And uh, you'd be surprised sometimes, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, other, you know, people on the other side of these things, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes um, understand that, you know, there is gonna be, they probably wouldn't prevail in a lawsuit and so they want to, it's an opportunity for them to get with you and then maybe um, you're not getting everything for your client that you want, but at least you brought them to the bargaining table, the other side, and there's a cost benefit analysis that your client needs to consider about whether to push forward with the lawsuit or not. Right. Um, so the easiest way to talk about that, you know. So let's say you're going to recover $50,000 from the company, but you're going to spend $20,000 on an attorney. So really you're going to pocket 30 grand. So if you send a demand letter and the company comes back and offers 35,000, then even though they're taking less, they're really going to end up with more. When all yeah, exactly. Down. And I have those conversations with people all the time, you know, on, on both sides, on both sides of the equation. But from the plaintiff side, you know, they're like, Hey, the, these people owe me money or this other business owes me money. I'm um, like, I always will request uh, of them to allow me to put a demand letter together first. And I usually make it sound like we're about ready to file suit, um, you know, it, to maybe rattle their cage or whatever. But part of that, I have to rely on the client also to tell me what the other person's like, you know, or what the other business is like, because they're in a position to know them sometimes and they may be. They may say, no, you just got to sue them. You know, right. they won't do anything until they're, they're going to take your letter and throw it away. And and I have to listen to my clients when it comes to that, you know. Well, and from the, from the company or from the person getting the demand letter, you know, the benefit is there is no lawsuit yet. There is no public record of it. You might be able to give the agreement in exchange for a non-disparagement clause. You know, you might avoid some negative reviews. You might avoid some issues on Glassdoor. You might avoid some, you know, damage to your reputation in the community. I mean, there's all sorts of benefits to keeping things quiet, potentially yes. from both sides. Well, definitely. Yeah. And that's an excellent point. Uh, even if you're the, uh, you know, it, the small business bringing the lawsuit, you know, uh, a lot of people may just become aware that you were involved in a lawsuit and not take the time to, go on to public records and see, you know, the merits of your case or anything like that. So they're like, wow, they really sued those people and that could have a negative effect on them. So, you know, there, there are business calculations being made all the time on both sides of the equation before a lawsuit gets off the ground. 
So let's say, you know, they get that demand letter, you give them 30 days, they tell you to go take a long walk off a short pier, go pound sand, you know, whatever expression you want. Um, what else are you doing before filing suit, if anything? Or is that going to be so case by case specific? Uh, no, depending on the type of case that it is, if it's not a small collection matter, uh, we're probably researching some of the legal issues because uh, maybe accompanying that demand letter will also be your proposed complaint for damages. So you're already initiating some of the research into this, at least pulling some cases or presenting a legal argument to the other side, especially if they're represented by counsel that look, we're probably going to prevail on this, we think, if we have to go forward with this, or at least we have a good shot of doing that because nobody can guarantee you know, how it's going to come out. But I, I think some good preparation with at least a complaint sometimes, uh, and by complaint, I mean a lawsuit, you know, where you're like, hey, we're going to, in addition to this demand letter, we're going to file this. So if you don't do anything, and, and, and also not only are you educating them about the case, but you're showing them that you're almost ready to file the lawsuit. Right. You know, so also the psychological, I've put this together. All I got to do is spend the money. It's filed and, you know, here we, here we go kind of thing. Now, so, from an ethics perspective, I mean, before you send that demand letter, you know, you have to have a viable claim. You have to have a good chance of success with a claim. You have to have a potential claim. I mean, what's, what's your ethical consideration in Florida? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you, we are as attorneys, um, we, we take what our clients say in good faith. So if they're presenting, I I can't, I'm not going to create a work of fiction in my demand letter. So they're saying this much money, I, I'm owed this much money because they didn't take care of some of these things. I'm not going to challenge them or question them on that. They don't have to provide me you know, all kinds of documentation to show that that's the case. But at the same time, if I'm seeing information or they're showing me information that's not accurate or they're like, look, you know, I know this company has a lot of money and they did really bad things to me in the past. Can you just sort of make this up or really exaggerate this or embellish this? Um, You know, then no. And, And in keeping with that, I'm also so and I'm also not you know, ethically bound, if it's like a $10,000 dispute, you know, I have clients that call me all the time or potential clients. They're not, they don't usually end up being clients. And they're like, well, this company, I want a million dollars out of them. You know, we're $500,000, but the claim is really worth more like 10000 unethical. I also can't, you know, promise that, uh, you know, they're going to jail or that what they did was fraudulent or, you know, what we would call sort of defamatory language, you know, I, I stick with, you know, um, legal options. Like some people will want to hire you because they want a flamethrower of a letter right. that, uh, you know, basically promises that you're going to do everything but set their house on fire, you know, and um, we're, we're ethically bound. And I would argue we should be morally bound not to do that. You know, I, I always put in my letters, Almost in every demand letter I send, if you don't comply with whatever we're asking for, I will have no choice but to advise my client of all legal options available under the circumstances to them, including but not limited to filing a lawsuit to protect their interests in this matter, period. Nothing beyond that. Um, Okay, so you've sent the demand letter. They've blown you off from that. Now suit gets filed. So you've got this complaint, you put the complaint together, you pay the court costs, it gets filed. Then you have to go pay for service of process to get it served on them. Am I right there? Yep. Exactly. And then they've got, you know, a period of time to respond to file their answer or a counterclaim or something along those lines. Yep. They, they uh, in the state system, they would have 20 days to respond in the state of Florida. Federally, it's 21 days. They, they give you an extra day. So... 20 business days, 20 regular days, 21 business days? 21 regular days, federal, 20 regular days, um, uh, state. So Saturday, Sunday, holidays count, but if that's the last day, it's going to extend to the next business day. It'll roll over to the next day. Yep, that's correct. Okay. 
So um, in that time frame, you know, you can still negotiate, you can still have open lines of communication. There's nothing that prevents them reconsidering blowing off your demand letter. Am I correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and I've often, when I've brought suit, um, I've had situations where um, the defendant, may, whether they're represented by counsel or not, they'll sometimes just call me before they filed an answer and just say, look, I know I owe the money. Can we work this out? Uh, sometimes even through an attorney, like, look, I don't want to be bothered to file an answer um, or I'll give them an extension of time to file an answer so that we can try to negotiate something in good faith. You know? And then after that, then we're talking about the, the discovery being the next stage. I mean, doing requests for produce and admission, and that, those kind of things. Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, you raised a really good point and that is that those 20 days, on either side of the aisle shouldn't be, I, I, I never just file a lawsuit and then just forget about that for 20 days while I wait for an answer. You know, I'm looking at strategies and opportunities for outreach to the other side to say, look, because it's going to get more expensive for your client if you have to do discovery, you know? So I, I, I like to try to use that time and to the extent that, and you, you certainly don't want to burn any bridges with, opposing counsel or even a pro se person, you know, you're like, look, this is big business. Let's see if we can, you know, if you need a little more time to get an answer together or get money together so we can resolve this, then I'm going to give that time to you, you know? So, but then if you can't do it within that time period, yes, you have to look at different discovery devices like a, a deposition where you're putting somebody under oath and then finding out what they know about the case or maybe what they're, financial situation is, um, interrogatories and requests for admissions, which are, in essence, basically just uh, sending, you know, uh, questions out to the other to the other side. With interrogatories, it would be the actual party to the lawsuit, finding out, you know, detailed answers to questions. And, um, you know, I like to use everything and then do the deposition. So get all, get your interrogatories answered on the plaintiff side, uh, request for admissions answered. If there's documents, you can do a request to produce, you get all that information together, and then you set your deposition. And if you've done your discovery right, you just refer to the discovery and say, well, you remember when you answered question number six, when I sent you these interrogatories, ma'am or sir? Yes, okay, well, you said here this, is that still true or you, know, you, you, you can use the rest of the discovery to set up your deposition, which is another discovery tool. Well, and so a lot of this seems to be the most, the easiest part to spend money because ultimately, you know, a lot of this you're paying by the hour. You've got all these documents going back and forth. You're writing them. You're requesting answers. You're reviewing the answers. You're writing the answers. You're taking depositions, you know, for a large company, you may end so it, it sounds like this phase, the discovery phase, is going to be the most obvious spot to spend a lot of money because you're drafting these requests, you're sending them out, you're waiting on answers, you're reviewing the answers, you're sending another batch, you've got documents to review, then you're sending depositions, you could be deposing you know, 10, 25, 50 people at a business depending upon how large it is. And for most of this, I mean, you're, you're, being, you're charging the client hourly. Correct. And that's why I spent a lot of time with clients talking about what our strategy would be in this situation. Because from the plaintiff side, at least, well, from both sides, but from the plaintiff side where you have the control, because your client, you on their behalf, you're filing the lawsuit, you know, that, that you have to try and figure out from them, what are they trying to accomplish? If they're like, look, this business owes us 50 grand. If you can get them to pay us 20, I'm not going to just sit there and bill you, you know, as the client and just say, no, we got to go through all this discovery. We got to do this. We got to do that. Right. I try to put a strategy together that to the extent that I can, I can't always, but to the extent that I can, I'm not just billing you for the sake of billing you. So let's see if we can get them maybe an early mediation, which we haven't talked about yet, but just, um, you know, where we can try to settle the matter early or, anything like that. So I want to figure out what their budget is for this. And it's really important to talk to it, really listen to your client. What are they trying to accomplish out of this? You know, because 
oftentimes they're just mad at the other side. I want to sue them because I'm angry. Get it, got it, totally good. Um, but what you know, we we are we deal with financial compensation for the most part in civil litigation. What are the dollars and cents? What how does it make sense for you to have me file this lawsuit under these circumstances? And you really should have more than just I hate that person or I want to make their life miserable or something like that. Even if you have a claim, you know, right. it doesn't make sense from a financial standpoint. And that's I spent a lot of time talking to them about the financials of that and how expensive, as you so eloquently stated, when you get to that discovery point, that's where things get really expensive very quickly. And I always, you know, I like you talk about people wanting money out of it, but I mean, sometimes they want like specific performance. They want the other company to actually do what they promise to do. And a lot of times it doesn't make any sense. Like if you guys just got embroiled in six months of litigation and throwing mud at each other, why do you really want these two businesses to work together? Or why do you really want to give this employee their job back or, or have the company give you as the employee their job back after you've gone through all these things? You know, a lot of times money is the easiest way to remedy so many of these things because money isn't emotional. Sure. And so the thing that I love about the concept that we're working all these off of contracts is a lot of times those contracts will limit what we actually need to discover. You know, if you have an employment agreement, that's going to limit a lot of the requests to produce that we have. If you have an, uh, an employment agreement, that's going to limit a lot of the questions of deposition. Am I right there? Yeah, definitely. Yep. So even if these documents don't totally stop litigation, they can make litigation cheaper because we don't need to have, hey, send me 15,000 emails between the two of you so that we can put together what was this operating agreement that you all never put down to 10 pieces of paper. It, it's such a good point. I mean, you just, when the, the, to the extent that you can clarify and bring brevity to your arrangements from the beginning, because if you don't have that, then it's about piecing the case together, right? Piecing the relationship together. And yeah, ex uh, emails, perfect example. You know, you don't have to send me 30,000 emails, but whether you had an agreement, you have a written agreement that's right there, you can refer to, et cetera. But um, yeah, I mean, you know, and some of that discovery is just, like you said, 30,000 emails and just, you know, endless documents and, things where you're trying to prove your case like a, a jigsaw puzzle almost, but maybe a puzzle that you could never possibly put together, you know, in two lifetimes. So. Well, I always loved, you know, I had some friends I went to law school with who had, who had either difficulty finding jobs or at least difficulty finding full-time jobs who took a lot of document review jobs for the first, you know, three months, six months, a year or two. And so there's these companies that would hire, you know, 35 lawyers at 50 bucks an hour just to go through emails, just to go through papers, just to go through, you know, looking for that smoking gun that had been turned over in discovery. Yeah. And I'm sitting there thinking like, all right, well, if they're paying you 50 bucks an hour, then that firm's probably billing $150, $200 an hour for your work times, you know, 30 attorneys times eight hours times four weeks. I mean, that's insane. Some of the costs of these will get to. Exactly right. So, um, and if you have to do that, you have to do it. And sometimes, you know, there's enough money that's that you, you know, you're if the, if the amount that you're trying to pursue is big enough, it may be well worth your while. And your hope is that you can get attorney's fees on the other end. But yeah, uh, I think we've we've definitely uh, covered the fact that discovery litigation is so expensive. Right. And well, the process is the most expensive part of, well, that and trial. I mean, if you have a two or three week trial and you're billing a certain amount per hour and it's a three week trial, you just got to do the math on that. It could be a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars, you know? Well, but the thing to that, that I always tell you is if you're going to have a three week trial, you're going to have, you know, nine months of discovery. Plus at the end of the trial, the case is in theory going to be over. Whereas at the discovery stage, you're still talking about pretrial motions. You're still going to have motions for summary judgment. You're still going to have other parties being in, in, interpled or subrogated or whatever it is into it. You're still going to have, you know, pretrial conferences to go to. You're still going to have any other motions and then you're going to get to trial. I right. mean, for, for a lot of this, you know, trial may be the most worthwhile expense because you're so pot committed beforehand that at least now it's over and you get a decision. 
Well, and that's why, you know, sometimes it makes sense to have earlier mediations because when both parties are so dug in and they've spent so much money already, sometimes they just can't see an exit strategy. You know, right. like, why I paid you all this money already. I can't just walk away from this. And it's almost, I mean, you don't argue with your client, but you're like, well, all I can say is it could get worse, you know, but uh, I, I get it. Yeah. And so when we're talking about mediation, really we're talking about the same pretrial negotiations. However, we're bringing in a mediator, we're bringing in a third party. Usually it's a, you know, more ex a very experienced attorney in the community or a former judge or somebody who's going to get that outside perspective, right? Uh, correct. Yeah. A, a lot of them are uh, judges. Uh, they all, I, I think everybody has to um, take a, uh, a, a mediation I guess program or seminar and be a certified mediator after you complete this and you know and, and so on and so forth but um, the thing that's important to understand there that I explain to clients is that you know especially initially sometimes before they've really paid you out any money as your attorney as their attorney and when they're still mad enough maybe at the other party you know they they'll say well I don't want to I just don't want to negotiate anything. Here are my demands. If they don't meet these demands, right, we're done here. And I explained to them that mediation is not a – it's voluntary whether you settle at mediation. So you have the right to walk out of mediation anytime you want. I'm done. I'm out of here. I had a situation a couple of weeks ago where uh, it was – it ended rather abruptly and some – you know, kind of bad feelings all the way around. I, I've been a part of that many times, um, you know, uh, but what's not voluntary is, and this, especially in this particular case, um, my clients really were not interested in, in, in being a part of a mediation, but the court is requiring that they be part of a mediation. And right. if, if they just wouldn't, you know, allow me to schedule a mediation or they didn't show up for it, they could potentially be held in contempt or there could be other sanctions. So I explained to all my clients, look, you're going to have to mediate this at some point anyway. So what does it hurt if I just throw out some negotiations to them right now? You know, Which I will say, I understand in theory the required mediation. In practice, I don't really like it because you know, you, you'll, you've been doing this for 30 years. You've got those clients or you've got those opposing counsels or opposing parties. You know, this is never going to work out, but now our, our, my client's going to be out an extra three or four or five thousand dollars to prep me for mediation to pay the mediator for us to go for the time when this isn't going to get resolved. Exactly. Exactly. So it, it's so important just from the beginning to let people know what this voyage looks like. You know, right. Uh, it, it may sound like, you know, let's just go ahead and sue them. I want you to be aggressive and sue them. I, I've had thousands of people tell me that over the years. Right. I'm always like, yep, I'm there for you. I can do it. But here's what you need to know, you know, at every step of the, every sort of every step of the way. So, you know, I, I very much want to try to resolve matters short of litigation or early in the litigation process if I can, because I always also consider myself, you know, a, a a good steward of my clients money you know a lot of small businesses don't have endless resources where they can you know sue people and right. pursue them and that type of thing you know well, I'll, I'll never forget you know one of my all-time favorite lines in law school was my mediation class our professor always said that the best mediations end with both sides leaving a little bit disappointed and exactly. i just thought that was it was so true and it stood with me because you know you're looking at it from like all right the plaintiff wants $100,000, the defendant wants to pay $30,000, they meet for like sixty five, dollars and everybody goes home a little bit disappointed. Yeah. Well, be, because the alternative is, and all every mediator will say the same thing, it's if you go to trial, there's one winner and one loser, and you don't want to be the loser of that. Well, you can end up being a big loser. At you know? best. I think a lot of times you go to trial, there's two losers because they're in for so much money to not recover enough to make up for the time or the ruined relationship or, you know, whatever it is. Sure. Yeah. So that's absolutely true. At best you'll have one winner. All right. So between those stages, between the mediation though, um, we're going to have pretrial motions. We're going to have pretrial conferences. We're going to have uh, motions for summary judgment. We're going to have, 
you know, potentially hearings on discovery if they don't disclose certain things. You know, I don't want to get too into those because those tend to be so case specific, but any, any consistent pretrial steps that we want to cover that we haven't gone over yet? Uh, well, no, just that, you know, uh, we want to make sure that we're doing the work when we're preparing for those pretrial and scheduling conferences and things like that. So, you know, um, you, you got to really, um, you know, know and explain to your client what a case management order looks like. In other words, we've got to have all this discovery wrapped up by this date. We have to have our motions done by this date. If we're going to make, there's a thing called an offer of judgment, offer of settlement. I don't know if we have to really get that far into the weeds, but there's a legal mechanism by which you can force another party sometimes to pay attorney's fees. If you go to trial, you know, there's a time frame for that. So what are you doing and how are you explaining to your client uh, you, what you're doing to prepare for those deadlines? Because a lot of judges, you know, they, they, they're they the ones setting those deadlines. So if you're not working within those boundaries, you're going to have a problem with the judge, you know, where they could maybe strike some of your discovery requests if they're not timely filed or what have you. And so sometimes you have to get the client on board as well, explaining to them, you know, we got to do this by X amount of time or you, you know, a, a lot of people don't think that they have, they think discovery is optional, right? Like just, well, these documents are asking for, they're very personal. Right. Why do they need to know about my finances? Um, you know, they're just prying. Uh, if you were really aggressive and a good attorney, you would tell them to stop doing this. Can't you just stop, tell them to stop? And I have to oftentimes say no. I mean, there's situations where documents are privileged and so forth, but, you know, um, you have to explain to them the repercussions if they don't do that. But also say, look, you know, you want them saying, you know, if the shoe's on the other foot, you don't want them just saying, well, I'm just not going to be a part of this. You know, so. So we get through, you know, as lawyers, we wear a lot of hats. So you've got the therapist hat, you've got the lawyer hat, here you've got the teacher's hat to really kind of walk them through a lot of this stuff. But all right, so we get through all those things, you know, we get to trial, we're going to pick a jury or we've got a judge, we're going to do opening statements, we're going to call witnesses, we're going to have, you know, uh, motions for directed verdict after the case, we're going to have rebuttal witnesses, we're going to have a closing, you get a judgment, and then at the end of that, you know, the decision there, then one side owes the other side money, but you could appeal it, you can renegotiate, you can do all those things. So kind of walk me through, you know, I don't want to talk on the trial process too much, but walk yeah. me through that post-judgment, you know, what are some of the, the issues and the situations that come up after a trial that they still have to consider when it comes to, you know, committing to litigation? Well, sure. So you, are you mean uh, from the plaintiff side that once they've obtained the judgment, like, well, or, or, I mean, from both sides, you know, there's always the, the jury awards, you know, the plaintiff $2 million defense comes back and says, Hey, if you'll take 1.5, we won't appeal it. I mean, right. you know, you, got, you still have some rights there to slow the case up or to slow pay or, you know, something. So explain to me the, the analysis there for sure. a business after a judgment. Yeah. So if you're the losing party, you've been sued. Uh, let's say you're a business, uh, you lose, there's a judgment against you. Um, you know, you have the right, obviously, if it went to a trial, either a bench trial, like just a judge or a jury trial to move for a new trial. And as attorneys, we should always be doing that in cases, but as a prelude, and sometimes you have to before you file an appeal or you could file an appeal. But again, much like when we're talking about the complaint and then the answer, we're also using that time, as you said, to try to get something worked out. Like, look, uh, we won't appeal you if you agree to reduce, you know, or, or accept less than what the jury gave you in this regard. Or can we come up with something else because my client only has limited resources? So would you rather have X amount of money, a bird in the hand, as opposed to... Um, you know, as opposed to nothing, because whatever side you are, it, it's oftentimes, I, I had an attorney, uh, an older attorney tell me when I was much younger, that oftentimes the hardest part about a case is winning and then collecting on a judgment, 
Right. But some people, you know, and this was one of the things you have to ask your clients, right, on the plaintiff side. Does this person have any money to pay you? You might have the best causes of action in the world against them. Do they have any ability to pay you? You know, that, that you know of. I mean, I, I know that they don't know all their finances, but it'll at least draw you in a conversation with your client. Sometimes they'll say, well, they, they drive a nice car. They're right. Using the information that, that's at, at hand. And I get that. Well, they drive a nice car. They're worth $2 million, but they've got $7 million in liabilities to drive the nice car. Well, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, uh, have they declared bankruptcy? Are they about to? Um, because collecting on judgments, even when the per the entity that you're collecting from or the person you're collecting from is solvent, they've got the money to pay. Put that money in certain, you know, vessels and, and what have you to make the person judgment proof. Right. Or maybe they just own some nice things, but they don't really have any money. You know, so everybody in the process understands that even if you have a judgment against somebody, it's, you know, it doesn't automatically mean, you know, you don't go to jail if you don't not pay them or something along those lines. So we all know the collection process is tricky in and of itself. That's another incentive, even post-judgment, try and get something settled, you know. Um, now, from the plaintiff side, if you win a judgment, you can always attach, you know, certain bank accounts. You can um, and there are discovery devices that you would oftentimes use, uh, like a deposition in aid of execution, to determine, you know, what their resources look like, what their finances look like, so that you can figure out, well, you know, are they, is this something, can I garnish their wages? Are they an employee somewhere? Or, you know, that type of thing. So, but it's not an easy process. You know, you can win the bank. I use this exact term with, with clients on both sides of it. You can win the battle and lose the war, you know? Right, it's a, uh, it's a pure victory. Yeah, you got your piece of paper that says you have a judgment against somebody. Nobody can ever take that away from you, but collecting on the judgment is oftentimes very difficult. All right, so you know we've talked about creating the documents, we've talked about the demand letter, we've talked about litigation, we've talked about trial. You know anything else that we need to talk about when it comes to that kind of chain of events? No, and I, I, as you said, you know the trial. You know, separate entity that, uh, you know, I, I would always speak with my clients about w w had the different processes of a trial. But I think for our purposes today or, or over a series of days, depending on who's seeing this at what time, you know, you want to avoid trial if you can. You're doing everything you can as the attorney on both sides of this to avoid an expensive trial where potentially you could get nothing or you could lose everything. And that's why all these things that we discussed in terms of, um, you know, the setting up and preventing litigation to, you know, how you should properly proceed with litigation, what strategies you should employ, you should always be doing so with no clients the same. So, right. you know, what is, how are you acting in the best interest of your client, you know? Just jumping on a table, yelling and screaming, that you're a bulldog and you're gonna, you know, um, you know, torch the courthouse with the best trial ever known, and you know, you're gonna put on a show when you're in front of a jury. That's, you know, that may be great for a movie, but not in real life. You know? Well, that's why, you know, I always love when clients ask me about my litigation experience and if I enjoy litigation, because I'm always like, look, you know, everybody at our firm has, or almost everybody at our firm has done 50, 60, 70 trials. Like, we're not afraid of litigation. And I always love doing it because litigation's 99% of the time always great for me. It may not be great for the client. So it's always interesting to try and, you know, not, I don't want to say talk the client down, but really explain to them, like, look, if we go to trial, I'm going to get paid a bunch of money. Hopefully I'm going to get you a bunch of money too. But at the end of the day, like you're the business, you're the person, you're the one who's, you know, on the hook here. I don't have that same problem. Yeah. Because, you know, we're all, somewhat wired the same way as litigators too. It's fun to make the argument. It's fun to talk to a jury about your legal theory of the case. 
you know, that's, that's, that's why we became attorneys, a lot of us. You know, we saw this in movies or television shows or we saw other people doing it and we thought, you know, that's where we're naturally maybe argumentative or we like to share our opinions with people. And so, you know, my dad was the one that said, you're going to make your money with your mouth. So, you know, early on and, and started me thinking about becoming an attorney. But well, it doesn't necessarily do your client. You're not doing your client any service because, like you said, they're the ones that are paying the freight for this. You know, so. right? You don't you don't see any of those movies dedicated to the perfectly well written demand letter. You don't see it yeah. to like that great request for produce. You don't see it for you know a really successful mediation. You see it for you know the the actual the trial issue. And then obviously, you know that's why I hate I hate that a civil action is a true story because of the ending. But I love the fact that they did a movie on that to explain to people that, like, the little guy doesn't always win. You know, sometimes they have that great offer, they say no, and then they get hammered at trial to the extent that the, the plaintiff's firm ends up going out of business. And you're right. There haven't been too many movies about demand letters and all the grunt work that goes in other than maybe showing a picture of a couple of attorneys after a long night and their ties askew and right. they're drinking coffee or scotch or whatever it is, or maybe both, you know. But uh, – but, all that stuff not only maybe can prevent a trial, but if you have to have a trial, if you're doing a good job, you know, with starting with a demand letter, starting with listening to your client, getting that information in place all through the process that we've discussed, uh, you're going to set yourself up to to uh, be a better advocate if you do have to have a trial. You know? So it's all a, right. it works both ways. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me.